Good morning, psych students. Welcome back to Social Psychology. Today, we're going to take a break from horrifying experiments of Dr. Zimbardo and Stanley Milgram and move toward uh, attribution theory and attitudes. So some of the stuff that uh, it doesn't involve as many ethical violations or realizations that deep down inside we would... Uh, electrocute someone if we were told to or totally get lost in the power of the role or the power of the situation and act in ways counter to our ethical and moral principles. So the whole idea with attribution theory, you know, if we're looking at your little note packet on social psychology. So with attribution theory, it's basically the idea, how do we explain other people's behavior? Hey, why, why do other people do the things they do? And this is part of kind of a larger next couple of days. We'll be talking about attitudes and beliefs and things that, that people, you know, do do your attitudes necessarily follow your beliefs or, or sorry, your, do your actions follow your attitudes, your attitudes follow your actions, things like that. So we'll start, like I said, attribution theory. Why do people do the things they do? So I'll just give you an example. Let's say Connor's walking down the hall and you see Connor trip. Okay. How would you explain that behavior? Okay, so you know, there's lots of different ways you could. Okay, you know, maybe Tyler stuck his leg out and tripped him that way, or maybe Connor's just clumsy. But the basic idea of attribution there, how we're explaining behavior. Most of us commit what we call fundamental attribution error. Okay, so I'll give you another example. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll finish that example first. So fundamental attribution error, the basic idea is when we see someone else mess up, make a mistake, we tend to blame the person. Okay? We tend to overestimate their personality or the personal dispositions and underestimate the situation. So I'm sure you've had this situation. We can use e-learning as an example. Okay? Uh, fundamental attribution error, let's say I committed as a teacher. And let's say, I don't know, one of you doesn't turn, well, we'll say Kaylin doesn't turn in her e-learning. As a teacher, okay, committing fundamental attribution error, I would say, well, she's not doing her e-learning because she doesn't care. Okay, I put it on you as the person. You got to overestimate the personality. Okay, whereas there's lots of, and that's one of the things they're advising us not to do in this whole wonderful new world of e-learning, is don't do things like that because there's lots of different possible situations that could be getting involved. Okay, uh, same thing would go, let's say Kyler fails a test. If I commit fundamental attribution error, I say like, well, it's the, it's Kyler's personality. He failed because he's lazy or he's dumb. Okay, he just doesn't care about school and that's why he failed. Okay, I'm committing fundamental attribution error because it could be maybe a rough night with other homework or family emergency, things like that. There's lots of different things that could have been involved. Okay, so that, that's the idea of fundamental attribution. I overestimate the personality. I underestimate the situation. Now, this is what it comes when it comes to other people, when you see other people and try to explain other people's behavior. Okay, so it's their personality. It's not the situation. Self-serving bias is a little bit of a flip side to that because self-serving bias involves your own explanations for why things happen to you. Okay, and basically for us... If we succeed, who do we hold responsible for that? That's right. We take the credit. Uh, we, If we do well on something, whether it's sports or academics or another activity, we tend to take all the credit. When things don't go wrong, we blame the situation. Or if things do go wrong, we blame the situation. You know, it's not my fault because, you know, this happened, this happened, and this happened. That's self-serving bias. Michael Scott once put it best, if you've ever seen the Office episode, where he dressed up like Willy Wonka and ended up giving a huge discount to Blue Cross Blue Shield, and then it blew up in his face. So he decided to pawn it off on Dwight. Then David Wallace came in and said, hey, you know what? This is actually a great idea. And at the end, Michael Scott says, I want all of the credit and none of the blame. That's basically what self-serving bias is. So you think of fundamental attribution error is how we explain other people's behavior, especially when other people make mistakes. We blame the person, not the situation. 
when it's us, self-serving bias, we take all the credit if it goes well. So if, if, if we succeed, it's our personality. I did this. I'm awesome. If we fail, it's the situation. Okay. You know, and, and somebody, it, it, we all do it. You know, I've, I've done it many times in my life. You know, when, whenever I had a good performance in track or cross country in high school, I always say, yeah, I just, I had a great race, you know, thing, you know, things are really clicking for me out there today. All my, all my hard work is paying off. If I didn't have a good race, well, it was Coach Shaver's fault. Coach Shaver didn't prepare me well for this. And, you know, or maybe I ate something that didn't agree with me. You know, I, I blame the situation, things like that. Right? I got cut off by some kid from Rockton, Hananiga. You know, and it threw off my whole race, but it, it was definitely not my fault. It was the situation's fault. It's, so, you know, we can, we'll use Kaylin as an example again. Softball, she hits a home run. Next year, DePaul, oh, you know, she hit a home run because she's awesome. Okay, she's the most talented player in the world. Okay, and if she strikes out, well, you know, there was a bug in her eye. Okay, or the other team cheated. <laughs> Things like that. You blame the situation. So that's self serving bias. Okay, so they're kind of two sides of the same coin where, you know, how do we explain other people's behavior, fundamental attribution error? How do we explain our own behavior, self-serving bias? The one in turn, we'll, we'll flip to the next, or go down to the next one, because it's an important experiment in psychology. It's a good concept to, to head into the weekend with. Cognitive dissonance. Okay, so the, the experiment that was done, not an unethical one, but just kind of a boring one. Leon Festinger set up a situation where he had a bunch of college kids go into a room and the experiment was to turn knobs. Like literally just turn knobs over and over and over and over and over again. Okay. And it seems pretty boring. And they, they did it, I don't remember how long, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, maybe maybe less time. But they did that for a while. And then afterwards, he paid them. A for their time he gave him a few in the 1960s, so they didn't give him like 20 bucks or anything, but they gave him a few bucks. Then here's what the experiment really was. So, you know, you turn knobs, you get paid for it. The experiment was then tell other people about the experiment. Your experience, not not telling them is there what happened, but tell them if you enjoyed it or not. And so here's where the cognitive dissonance is. You just did something tremendously boring and uninteresting, and now then you got paid. You have a conflict. Okay, It was horribly boring, but you got paid. You have two conflicting thoughts. That's the essence of cognitive dissonance. Okay, So the idea of cognitive dissonance is when thoughts contradict each other or thoughts and actions contradict each other. And how do we resolve that dissonance, we'll say it. Because what LeFestinger found is in the experiment, most people went overboard telling people, telling the next participants how awesome the experiment was. Yeah. They, didn't really, they didn't tell them how they, they, oh, it was fun. I learned so much. It was so interesting. Things like that. They, they didn't just say, yeah, it was okay. Like they went overboard in explaining how wonderful the experiment was. Okay. So they, this is that term where we talked about it. Back in the personality unit, rationalization, you try to rationalize things and you see cognitive dissonance, it exists because we all want to be consistent. None of us want to be hypocrites. So, you know, we don't want to, you know, do one thing and say or say one thing and do something else. Or if we have two conflicting thoughts. How do we resolve that? So, you know, this is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to have two conflicting thoughts in your head. We'll, we'll use this as an example. Let's say I consider myself a generous and kind person. Okay. And then I see a homeless person in Chicago and I don't give them money. Well, if I'm a generous and kind person, I should probably try to help that homeless person. How do I resolve the fact that my thoughts, hey, I'm a good person who cares about other people and my actions, which is not not helping this person? Well, we rationalize it. Okay? You, know, you probably heard people say, oh, I'm, I'm not going to give that homeless person money because they'll just use it on drugs. Okay, or they'll use it on alcohol, or maybe they deserve the what they get right there. That's kind of, that's resolving cognitive dissonance. I have you know a thought in my head: be kind, help your fellow man, and the action where I don't help my fellow man. So how do I resolve that dissonance? 
I rationalize it. I, you know, I explain it to myself so that I, so that I can still feel like a good person, okay, while not necessarily doing the good thing. That's cognitive dissonance. Okay, how do you know we we experience that discomfort coming from those conflicting thoughts, and we we try to explain them away. And you see this. I mean, I'm not going to get all political with you guys. Obviously, we have enough of that in the world. But you know, th think about times when your your favorite politician, maybe it's you know Vice President Biden, President Obama, President Trump. Okay, well, whenever any of our political leaders has you know done something that you know makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable, you're not you don't agree with it, but you still want to support. President Obama or President Trump, how do you then explain their behavior? They're like, well, I'm a good person and I support, you know, this politician because they're a good person. And then the politician goes and does something horrible. Uh, I still support them, but they did something horrible. How am I going to resolve that dissonance? And you see that a lot in people trying to explain away why politician A is OK, even though that politician did a bad, bad thing. It's we're resolving cognitive dissonance. So you know, that's it's, it's one of the more powerful terms. I think it's it's good to know. And it's interesting to see people kind of twist themselves into knots and pretzels as they try to figure out, you know, why it's why it's OK that they did this bad thing and that they're still a good person. Cognitive dissonance. So that's it for the week. Hopefully you have a good weekend. We'll see you again on Tuesday talking about different persuasion methods, how to get people to do what you want.